the honor I have today to be the one representing the Board of General Superintendents in this greeting to you. For several weeks now, despite social distancing, the Church has made creative provisions for our unity. The Lord's table is just one of those provisions. Through this sacramental practice, we draw closer to Jesus Christ and are enabled as equals not only to think of each other, but also to do something for each other. That something translates into words of encouragement, prayers, gifting, dreaming, readiness for the future, and much more. Only God can keep us together in this way as we focus on the mission of Jesus Christ. We are imperfect people, each one contributing to the building up of God's spiritual temple. This reminds us of the words that King David used to encourage his son Solomon to give his best to the temple project. David said, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And behold, the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God and with you in all the work will be every willing man who has skill for any kind of service. Also the officers and all the people will be holy at your command. Using the figure of Solomon's temple as an example, we can then see that we are to build the temple of God together. Together we can come to an amazing understanding of God's plan and actions as well as our roles and potentials in God's purposes. In this project of God, there are a few things we ought to keep in mind. First, the Lord is with us. The Lord God, even my God, is with you, said David. It was within David's power to find and contract the best available planners, managers, architects, engineers, and all kinds of experts to help Solomon. This David did, but he wanted his son to depend on God more than on any other helper. David had a deeply personal relationship with God, the one to whom he referred, even my God. This God had delivered David, had empowered him, and now he wanted his son to have a deep relationship with his same God. Current events in our world require wisdom, understanding, courage, and the will for us to overcome evils. We need historians, sociologists, politicians, counselors, etc. But only the Lord who sent his son Jesus to give sight to the blind, freedom to the captives, and salvation for all can lead us in this stage of temples building. The plan is His, and it is good. Just as David discipled his son, we ought to disciple our sons and daughters, both in the human sense and in the Christ sense. We do this one son and one daughter at a time, changing the way we see and serve each other. Second, the Lord is our finisher. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Our setbacks and failures do not hold God from finishing the plans that He set in His heart to accomplish. Jesus came to get it done and He made His mission very clear using these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. He has also made it clear that he comes on us to get it done. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the work that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. No power of this world can stop Jesus. When uh, he made this declaration, he knew that some of his immediate doers were weak and had no social status to use as platform. The only qualifying condition that he set then and now is faith in him. We, the doers of today, also are weak and imperfect, and God still trusts us to get it done. In the life of Christ, we find the example for what to do. During these trying times, the church is responding uh, with participation in the mission and impact on lives of many across the world. The NCM uh, update uh, states, Nazarene churches around the world are springing into action organically to serve more people in need. By the power of God's love and amazing grace, united, we must improve or even change the way we act in response, not only to the physical pandemic, but also to the human wickedness that causes suffering, losses, disrespect, discrimination, and division. Together, in obedience to the God we know, we will get it done. general superintendents, a lot of them, when they do speak, they speak in a way that revives people and brings people back to it, but we need to realize who we are. We are a peculiar people. We are a holy people, and that is not always easy for the world to get. It's not always easy to teach to people, and it's something that's even harder for individual adherence to our faith as Nazarenes to spread out to other people and to share. To share the fact that even though every church in this town preaches the good news and the gospel that they can be saved, we preach something a little different beyond that. We preach that we will have a great life in the next, but we're, we can have a great life now in the holiness and love of God. That's what makes us just a little different. That's because we are who we are. We are a sent people. We are a people that are supposed to go out, people that are supposed to be out, working with people. And that's what makes us a little different. I know you probably didn't even know we were Nazarenes before this all started, up, and you even just came. You just know we're the Hope Connection. That's because we're a sent people. We go out. We love people. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're called to do. Um, when, it, when you see holiness on a church sign, that's what it's supposed to mean. When you see it on our brethren over here, they, their, their church says holiness. They're a holiness church. They were Church of Christ. They're Wesleyans. They have a little Pentecostal thing that we don't do, but that's okay. They still feel that they should give love. Um, um, not Nathaniel's church, but... Uh, uh, well, all the Pentecostal churches in town. We have, we have a couple of them. They're part of the holiness church. They're part of the holy, yeah. you know, they're because all part the of the Nazarenes holiness. The and the Pentecostal and the assembly are all mm -hmm. meet at Tennessee or Kentucky for a holiness convention. And, and the Wesleyans and the, yeah, we, we all meet because we have that draw towards realizing that life doesn't end. I mean, this, this life isn't forfeit. This life is 
still capable of great love. Off. And that's what we're here to preach, and that's what we're here to teach. So today, we're going to worship. We're going to give it to God. And we're going to get to do some of the things we haven't done in a while. Like, I haven't heard you all pray in a long time. And I'm looking forward to that. You don't have to pray if you don't want to. It's okay. I pray all the time. All right. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. But right now, I want to start with the word, word and get our minds into the word of prayer. And that's what we need to be and where we need to be. So let's continue on in the word of prayer so we can worship, so we can praise God, so we can sing together. And we're all wearing masks so we can belt it out for Jesus. Right, Janie? Uh, all right. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for letting us be here. Thank you for blessing us to be in this place. Lord God, we invite your Holy Spirit into this house. We invite your Holy Spirit here to be with us, to worship with us, to be in us as we give it to you, Lord God. Take this time, take this place, take this moment of our lives and sanctify us, God. Come be with us. Sanctify your congregants, this congregation, and sanctify the church in the world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've given us. We thank you for your death on the cross. And today we come to you, our Lord and Savior. Please be here. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Every week we start with a prayer. And I'd like you to join with me once again. And we can actually say it together, and I can hear you this time. It's not just me listening to myself. Almighty God, you humble us by showing us your love, mercy, and truth. We want to connect with our Lord, so we beg. Teach us to love you more. Teach us to love your image bearers more. And teach us to love and steward your non-human creation more. Use us, Lord, to show others the hope faith and love we have in you, your one church, and in the gospel message we carry in our hearts. May God's will be our resolve. May Christ's light shine through our actions. May the Lord guide us by the word and by the Holy Spirit. May we be recognized as children of God. May all glory and honor be God's and God's alone. And all the church said, Amen. So, I know we probably have lots of prayer requests because lots of things have been weighing on our hearts. Uh, we need to keep definitely be in our prayers because she's not with us right now and she's, she's having a hard time. And uh, what else do we need to... How's your mama doing? Uh, well, she... Well, she's She's still in Texarkana? Yeah, she's doing it. She's like my coach. She's got a bunch of people taking her out. She had surgery. Yeah, she just didn't realize that we didn't pull the clothes. Yeah. And it, it's, it's horrible because only family can visit this time. Right. So. Oh, and only, only the same visitor. And only, yeah. At, 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 Came, that's the only person they can see. So we better make sure she's safe with me. <laughs> she wasn't about to let her brother in. How's your arm doing, brother? Oh, it's pretty good. Is it working better? Yeah, it's working better. He had to, uh, he had to rewrap it. He had to rewrap it? Yeah, I had to rewrap it. I posted, I got, I, I posted all that this Wednesday. Uh, no service, so that's good. And Amy just got a new home. I don't know if I'm supposed to share that or not, but it's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, you can. I mean, it, it's a happy moment. That's a praise. What? Any anything else going on that we need to pray for? Uh, just uh, just for my dad. He's I saw him yesterday, and I don't think he's gonna be around much longer. And on top of that, I need prayers for my friend William that he can get the help he needs to get on his feet and everything. Yeah. And other than that, that's about it. 
when you're getting on your feet, sometimes it's best to lift yourself up and not try to lift other people up too. So I'm glad you found a place that was separate. Yeah, so I just, um, I got to thinking about that camper we were looking at. And I'm, even though we're just good friends, there might be something later, but right now I just don't need any of that extra on me right now. So I just figure if I just get myself settled, then be happy that way. Drama's no fun. Miss Terry, you got anything going on? <coughs> Friends, if they find out what's going on with me. Um, Amen. Uh, set up some more testing, but I said it can't be too bad because like, they can't get me in until September the 10th. So I said, well, if I can get oxygen to my brain, then I guess I can wait until September the 10th to find that out. <laughs> That's the whole, that's the whole <laughs> purpose of having this. I have a pulse oximeter in my. I've got one too. I okay. Bought, I bought one. I've got. So I mean, if it's not uh, intruding in your business, but may I ask what, uh, what is going on? Uh, well, they thought that I had dehydrated a week ago, and then they thought it was my heart. They passed, but passed all that. They still haven't figured out what's causing me to have these dizzy spells. Oh, okay. When I had the dehydration, I had passed out and had two seizures, not like situations. Oh, no. And so that kind of put a scare in me. So now I've just been real patiently waiting on these doctors to tell me what's causing the dizzy spells. Is it going to be blood pressure, maybe? Well, that's what we thought. But we rule that out. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can just have our dizzy spells we'll together. Yeah, that's why I said. Because I've been having, having some too. So we just have huh? Did you put kind of depression medicine? No, I started taking. <laughs> told them I said this is giving me anxiety. So I'm taking it. Because um, Jerry, well, Jerry, uh, he decided uh, he thought the fact is, and they thought that's what was causing his dizziness. on my iPhone <laughs> and I've never put that kind of money in a phone before in my life and I thought, oh, how could you be so silly to leave it? <laughs> You're human. Everybody but makes mistakes. I couldn't get in and out of that doctor's office fast enough to get back and it, Lord, I mean, it was right there. I says, there are people, there's good people still in this world, I think, because that's the term it is. Because, I mean, that's a, that's a, a real busy gas station and truck stop and all mm -hmm. and, uh, we need to keep Mercy Street in our prayers Miss um, Linda when she reopened after COVID she lost everybody Mercy Street's a church plant oh okay so, we, need, we need to pray for our church plants in our district because and not just in our district, we need to play for church for plants, plants everywhere. everywhere because this this COVID <clears throat> has just slaughtered the normally, church plants. Normally, statistically, new church plants, only 50% survive. Now with uh, COVID, that number is more like less than probably 10 or 20% are going to survive through this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of churches, what they're doing is they're just saying, you know what? We're just putting it on hiatus, and we're going to pick it up when this COVID's over with. And they don't know if that's going to be three months from now or two years from now. A lot of them lost their funding. She's lost all. Of, she's ran out of all of her funding, and since nobody's there, nobody's tithing, so she can't even 
maintain the building they're renting. And let, do me a favor. Hmm. Do not put that on video. I'll, 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 I'll delete that one off the video. Let's edit that one out. That'll edit it out. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. you're right. It's luckily we're not on. We're not actually live right now, so. Just, um, just, just keep that just one. Just keep them in their prayers. That, that one's we need to keep in our prayers. We need to keep the other church plants in our prayers, and it's something that we really need to do. And We're one of the lucky ones, believe it or not. You know, because yeah. we don't have a lot of overhead right now. Um, we can pretty much go indefinitely, or at least tell Amy and I kick it. Um. <laughs> so we are very, very lucky. So... You know, we can keep going the way we're going, and we can grow, and then, like this, now we've kind of shrunk back because we've lost a few, and that's breaking my heart a little bit, but... I think, I think given, given, getting the swing of things back, because even when you had a building to come to, mm -hmm. church building, anytime someone has missed more than three Sundays in a row, yeah. it is so hard to get them back in the habit of coming back to church. And, you know, so it we takes need 20 to, days I mean, to... I, I fight that myself. I fought that. I, thought, I walked out there at 2.30 and I thought, oh, it's pouring on rain. I'm not... I went back to my bedroom and I said, Lord, I know it's, it's safe. I went back and got my... And it's, stuff, it, you know... Came it back takes, out and it wasn't raining anymore. So I said, okay, I'm gone. <laughs> it takes three weeks to make a habit and it takes less yeah. to break a habit. It really does. And we need to uh, pray for good habits and good things to happen. But let's also be very thankful. Let's praise for the fact that we are in the position that we are in. Yeah. Because as frustrating as it can be sometimes for our little church, and that sometimes we're not seeing the growth that we want to see, it's the growth that God wants us to do. And sometimes just going out and helping the one individual that mm -hmm. needs that is what God needs us to do right now. He may not need us to have members, but what he needs us to do is the mission that we're doing right and we need to praise him for that, and we need to be thankful for that. I mean, that's true, because our numbers, physically numbers, might not be growing. They are, because we're contacting people, but financially, we're, we're still growing. We're doing amazing. We're doing better than what, yeah. I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt y'all, but um, they say that people are brought in your life for one of two reasons, or a blessing or a lesson. Um, they, I had a couple people pray for me at the regular church service Wednesday, mm -hmm. and I, I still, I'm in shock from what they said, and I still don't know what to think about it, but somebody had told me that, uh, when they were praying for me, that I was a blessing, and that I was like a ray of sunshine, and that I just, with my personality, I just love people up, I make people get people to laugh and smile around me and I just have a good, wonderful personality and that anybody that I come in contact with, uh, you know, I cheer them up and everything. I don't know how to take that. I mean, in a good way, but it just, all my life I've been told that I was no good, useless, stupid, stuff like that. And that's the way I believe. And when people give me a compliment, I'm like, you're lying. No. Take the compliment. Take, take the compliment. It's a blessing because a lot of times when people are saying that, it's God speaking through them to you. It's trying to lift you up. And that's why everybody that we come in contact with, they may say, you guys are a blessing to us, but the truth is they're a blessing to us. Yeah. Providence is real. God does do things, and he moves in people. And I promise you, the people you talked to on Wednesday were from Pastor Daniel's church. And, every, and people from that church exude God. Yes. Oh, you know him? Pastor oh, yes. Daniel is one of my best friends. <laughs> oh, very good relationship with them. Yes. No, 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 no. Believe no, no. it or not, isn't that Jerry Crane's son? That's right. No, Pastor. Oh, no, this First Baptist. First Baptist. First Baptist. Yeah, I know Jerry Crane from a long time ago. I used we, to live here back in 2004. We all have Jerry, a Jerry. very good relationship with all the churches in town, and we support each other immensely. Oh, okay. I won't talk negatively about and, any of the churches in town because well, we, we love each other and yes. we work together, and 
we support each other. Sometimes they support us financially. Sometimes we support them prayerfully, and we do what we can. We can to help and, each other. And this is a very good community. And this is a place where they... And they, when you... Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't... I, I have... I'm sorry. In 30-some years, I've lived here. I have found a church family in this community that isn't uplifting. But, but, but you've got... If you get into the church itself and the people... Mm -hmm. I'm not hating the movement, but now that you're starting this, coming to church, this is going to be a habit when you get to where you're going. That's what you want So we digress. We have digressed. I'm so sorry. We need to get back on track. It's not black lines that matters. It's all lines that matter. That is true. That's true, but we're not going to get into that. He said, oh, wow. But politics are where we're going to get stuck in stuff. Yeah, crazy we're not stuff. getting into that. Brandy, would you start us out in prayer and go from you when you're done? Just say what you need to say. You can either say amen or Lord God, hear our prayers. Janie, if you want to pray, or so on and so forth down the line, and I'll close us out. How's that all work? Sounds good. Sounds good to everybody. If you want to pray, you can. You don't have to. If not, just say, Lord God, hear our prayers. Oh, and believe we'll... me, I'm always ready to pray. All right, let's go. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Dear Lord, let's go in heaven. Lead us and guide us as we go through your message today. Dear Lord, that we, we need, we need, we need your, we need your uh, uh, guidance. Also, Lord, uh, to heal the sickness, heal the pain, heal this, heal this coronavirus that's going on. Dear Lord, I come to you. Father, just thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you for allowing us this time to yes. fellowship together, to worship and praise your holy name, dear Lord. Bless each and every one of us that are present here today. Be with those that aren't here, dear Lord. I just say, look to you. You know who they are. You know the reasons that they aren't here, but we will keep praying that they do show. Dear Lord, we just know that your arms are wrapped around us and are strengthening us and helping us to love and show love to one another, dear Lord. Be with our country, dear Lord. It's, we want to keep you first and foremost in our country. And I just thank you for allowing us to have a country where we can worship you freely. Dear Holy Father, just be with each and every one of the government officials that make decisions for us, that, that they could see you and look for you for the answers before they start to vote on anything, dear Lord, that you can oversee their votes, dear Lord. We just praise and hold, lift them up to you, that they do your will, dear Lord. We ask that you be with each and every one of us as we go through the week. We ask that you be with Brother Hunt. He gives us the message, dear Lord. We ask this in mind. Lord, hear our prayers.
that. But the baby, you know all the things that are on our heart right now, Lord God. A transition to a new home is something hard to do, Lord God. Be with her as she travels and as she goes to her new place. And Lord God, bless the house that she's going to live in. Bless the heart that is of those who come to her. Lord God, continue to be with her and grant her the Holy Spirit every moment of her life. Indwell her mind, indwell her heart, and be with her always. Be with my wife, Amy, Lord God. Watch over her, guide her, heal her back right now. She's in pain, I know she is, Lord. She doesn't, she doesn't get quiet unless she hurts. Lord God, I know she's hurting. Take the pain. I trust that you are going to heal her. And we're, you're going to give her the hands that need to be there to heal her. Lord Jesus, thank you for Terry, for her heart, for her desire to care for others, her love, her desire to disciple and witness and be the person that she is, to love her family and to love her friends. Lord Jesus, you're She's in a little time of anxiety right now, and I ask that you lift her up, and that you grant her the peace that she needs through this healing time, this time of greatness that is going to be yours, God. Show us amazing. Lord Jesus, be with Janie right now as she worries for her mom. Her anxiety is real, and I understand it. Lord God, heal her mom. Make her pain manageable. Make her body comfortable. Lord Jesus, I ask that you go with the nurses and doctors that are with her. That you make sure that she gets the care she needs. In this time of COVID and separation and anxiety and pulling people apart, Lord Jesus, we need you to bring us together. Bring us together under your wings. Show us the light of God every moment of our lives. Lord God, be with Randy. Be with his wife, Billy. Be with both of them and bless their house. Bless everything that happens in their lives. Keep them safe. Heal Randy's arm. And we thank you for the healing that is happening in his arm. We thank you for the doctors that have been working with him. Lord Jesus, please be with Randy. Dwell him fully so he can do your good work. Be with everybody in this room, Lord God. And dwell us all. Continue to teach us the things that we need to learn. Teach us how to love you more. And teach us how to love your image better. More. Lord God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, who granted us great salvation in this world, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here with us right now, that dwells us as we worship you, as we pray for you, that comes out as the very breath of life. Merciful God, you are our King. You are our God. To you we pray. To you we lift everything to you. And at the foot of the cross we leave things that make us anxious. For you are all in all. We thank you for your Son, Lord Jesus, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I never fixed that slide. I never fixed that slide. I don't think people really realize that Satan is trying to keep us apart. So, that right. we... Uh, Socialize. Yeah. You don't. Hmm? So the love. Yeah. Uh, won't. Won't. Uh, 
they they will love they love one another. She will be a promise that goes from love and the opposite. So Satan does push against us, doesn't he? Every chance he gets. And he's gonna keep pushing. And we He's pushing on push my last nerve right now. And the fuck <laughs> and, and 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 socialize him and of course you can. Of and course you can. And I'm, love in one another. I'm so he's used to it. He's trying to tear the world apart. If people would only listen, they can see it. There is something good that's coming from all I'm gonna, this. I'm going to say this. There is something good that's coming from all this. The positive. the positive from all of this is I think Satan is losing the battle of halitosis. Amen. He's losing the battle. He's losing the battle, but he's losing the battle of halitosis because all of us have to smell our own breaths all day long. <laughs> so you know what bad breath is going to go away. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. <laughs> and each week we've been doing a psalm reading, but the problem is in the psalm readings, is they just have to be read to you. Not today. Not today. Repository, responsatory is a good thing. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul, and have I sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Be still, my soul. The Lord is on my side. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on my side. Amen. So we're still in ordinary time. It's not going to be anything strange that we're going to be in ordinary time for a long time. Does anybody know when ordinary time is over now? <laughs> Theological ordinary time. Advent. Advent. Christ is King Sunday is the week before Advent. That's the last Sunday of ordinary time. It's actually the first of the new year for oh, the church. November. It's in November. Yeah, it is a long time. It is a long time. Ordinary time lasts a long time, so it's kind of interesting. But we need to point it out. There is a space where we can kind of go anywhere in the Bible <coughs> where anything is good to go. And it allows us to speak to everything that's going in the world, but it also allows God to work in our lives. I still use some of these liturgical texts because they do pull us back to the understanding of God. And this will be the first time I've ever tried to preach a sermon with a mask on, so you're going to have to give me a little bit of a break. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking and we're going to be reading out of Genesis 22, um, 1 through 14. I don't know if everybody... Everybody did not bring their Bible with them today. But luckily, I figured that would happen because we're all out of habit. We forgot to bring our Bibles. Terry's cheating with the Bible on her phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said everything I have is on my phone. Everything's on the phone. It's also going to be on the screen today because I did make this worship for two different services. So, huh? I said you can brush your teeth if your breath still stinks. Sometimes. Sometimes. So, <laughs> I don't know if I'm even reading out of an NIV. I mean, I've got an ESV here, but it doesn't, in fact, I think I like the NIV better. So I'm going to read from the screen. So if y'all want to read from the screen with me, you're more than welcome to. Okay. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. 
he said to him, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son and your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountain that I show you, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, they set out to the place where God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey, and I will go with the boy over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and placed it, and placed it, uh, I mean, offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself, he and himself carried the, car- carried the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said, "Father." Yes, son. Abraham said, "The fire. I mean, the fire and the wood are here." Isaac said, "But." Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place where God had told about, Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on top of the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out the hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on your boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked there, and he saw the thicket with the ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called this place, the Lord will provide. And on this day, it said, on the mountain, the Lord will have, the Lord has provided. Yahweh Jireh. A lot of us have heard the word Jehovah Jireh before. And, okay. I'm not going to get into that today. This is a whole nother sermon for a whole nother day, but I knew I had to mention it because I say Yahweh Jireh, and I figured everybody else has heard Jehovah Jireh. The pronunciation thing, that's Hebrew, it takes time, and it takes a lot of stuff that I don't have for today because I've already, man, it took me an hour and a half in the last worship service, and with us squirreling the whole time, it's going to take longer. So I'm going to not describe that one today, (laughs) just for our sake and for the sake of time. In the sake that God will work that one into our lives. But join me in prayer and then we'll get started. Gracious Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O our Lord, our God, our Rock, our Redeemer. So, Yahweh Yairah. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but let's get into this. Who tests us in life? Devil. Devil does. Devil tests us. You got a good one there. People. Amy, Amy's pointing to God. You know, there's a picture of Job there. He, he had a bad day. Uh, you know, who else tests us? You do. I do. There you go. I did not put a picture of people. That's a, that's a boss, not a pastor. Um, <laughs> when's the last time you saw me wear a tie? Huh? Your parents see, and sometimes your children do too. <laughs> children test us all the time. It's it's one of those things. Our teachers do. Our doctors do. There's always a test. Our society seems to be surrounding tests. There's tests over there. Tests over there. There's tests to drive a car. There's tests to go to the doctor. There's tests for COVID where they molest your nose. There's all kinds of tests out there that seems like we're being inundated with tests over and over and over again. And it drives us kind of crazy, but that is what our society is sort of based on. No matter how old you get, you can always learn something. That is true. As we're getting into this concept of tests, our educational system is based on tests. 
If you stop and think about it, our culture has been hardwired. Not originally, it's just our standard going with an educational agenda on testing. If you go to school, you're tested. If you drive a car, you're tested. If you move, you operate big machinery, you have to take a test. To get a concealed carry license, you have to test. There's a test for almost everything. And if you don't pass the test, it comes with something else. And it seems like this testing epidemic seems to cover all of the quote-unquote civilized world. All of academia is ruled by testing. And this testing thing, it's real. Have you all looked at your high school transcript? When they said this is going to be on your permanent record, they weren't lying. The stuff that I, the tests that I took in elementary school are on my high school transcript. And then they showed up on my college transcript. Then they showed up on my grad school transcript. They're all, they, they, NTS tells me about what I did in elementary school when I grabbed that transcript. Wow. We are in a society of testing. It has inundated us. And you know whose fault it is? Modern psychology, my other love. Modern psychology has come up with reasons for testing, that they create predictors for the future. If you've ever taken the ACT or taken a test like that, they, it predicts how well you're going to do in college. If you ever know you're going to be at this subject in the future. The, the predictors that they see in tests, it measures aptitudes in individuals. It measures, it gives psychological insights, but they're static measurements. They're based on a concept of, a Latin-based concept of perfection. I think uh, Daddy's driver's license cost $2. Now, uh, uh, it, it's a lot harder to take the uh, written and driving part of the test than when I... You are absolutely right. Let's talk about driving tests. Let's talk about driving tests and what happens with driving tests, okay? Say, here, I just want to put this, say you have a 16-year-old kid. They fail the test six times. Let's say six times, okay? They get their test and they pass. Do you want to ride with them? Something in your head says, I don't know about this. But we think about, does everybody in this room have a driver's license? Yeah? Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, everybody in this room does. Yeah, so everybody has a driver's license. How many of those rules from that test do we actually follow? Who puts their hands at 10 and 2? I sure don't. <laughs> you were supposed to drive like this. I don't drive like that anymore. But that's on the test. You're supposed to put your hands at 10 and 2. Um, the the three-second following distance. <sighs> If you've lived in a big city ever, three seconds of following distance is an eternity on the highway. And it's just something you can't do. Stop, I mean, stopping at stop signs and you don't pause and go. Man, I'm, I'm bad. I, I've got actually tickets on my license that say I like to pause at stop signs, not stop. <laughs> so I can be honest with that one. You know, we don't always follow those rules as far as seat belts. How many people don't wear seat belts? Well, I'm not going to wear a seat belt because the government tells me I have to. <laughs> and you'll get a ticket, right? But it's still something that people will take. Parallel parking. Come on, how many times have you parallel parked this year? I can't parallel park with nothing. Yeah, did you parallel park this year? Yes, I did. When did you parallel park? Actually, downtown. Downtown here? Well, I'm impressed. I'm not very good at it, but I, 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 <laughs> I can parallel park like nobody's business. But the thing is, with those tests... If we would have not passed those five things, parallel parking, seat belts, stopping at stop signs, driving hand signs, hands not at 10 and 2, we would have failed the driving test. That might have been a thing that we would have failed that test and they would have parallel marked us as a failure. And people would have been disappointed in us. And people would have looked down on us being, oh, you can't do it. I passed my driver's test the first time. I was one of those kids. In fact, I missed one question. It's because... I couldn't see the test because it was too old, because the papers were completely phased, and I argued with the lady until she gave me 100%. <laughs> it drove my parents nuts, but uh, my obsessive compulsiveness just took over. So just because you don't always do those things, does it make you a bad driver? 
Just because you don't coach your hands at 10 and 2, just because you're not great at parallel parking, doesn't make you a bad driver. It doesn't make you any worse. If somebody's failed the test four times because they're not good at test taking, who's not good at test taking in this room? I know she's not. Are you good at test taking, everybody? Um, not, as long as it's not an IQ test, I'm good. You get nervous when you do test taking, and it's okay. But the world has tests for people. And if they don't meet those tests, then they're looked down upon. And if they're looked down upon, then it creates a level of shame in our culture. And that's part of the test-taking shame in our culture. If you take a big test, they say this will be on your permanent record. What does the permanent record matter anyways? Do you think anybody at any college cares what you took on your elementary school test? Not really. They don't give a flying hoot, I promise. You know, it, it doesn't matter how you did on your your elementary school test or you did on your high school test in the grand scheme of things because you're still alive, you're still doing things, you're still breathing, you're still being a successful member of society. The tests have come to mean too much. They've become something that I like to call pharisaic in, in nature because they've created rules because of the tests and the rules that are enforced with evilness. And now I want to show you somebody that is my friend. Well, was my friend. This is Brother Jerry. I loved Brother Jerry. He was an amazing man. He was a Marine. In fact, I'm going to tell you how I met him. I met him, I was, I was at a Veterans Day event. Um, we got free food because at the grocery store, it was a high vee I never heard of high vees but it was at a grocery store. And uh, they had free breakfast for us. And I was like, breakfast, free, good. I'm going to make something out of this. So I threw on a clergy shirt, and I grabbed a sign, and I put up free prayer. I was like, I'm going to pray for some veterans. I'm going to have a good time today, and we're going to do some evangelism while we're getting our free meal. Nobody had a problem with it, because it, it was a, it's a small town in Missouri. And uh, I'm doing this, and uh, Jerry comes up to meet me. He's like, I bet you don't know me. I was like, I bet I don't know you either, but I'm going to call you brother. I was like, I was like, Semper Fi, devil dog. Well, this is Marines, they do their thing. And I was looking at him and I was talking to him. We talked and we had a good discussion. We, Jerry was one of the people that could talk to anybody. God, I wish he would have lived longer after I knew him because I only knew him for a couple years. Because he would have been an amazing evangelist. He had a heart for other people. He'd give you the shirt off of his own back. He was trying to evangelize me in a way to try to get me to come to uh, the Marine Corps League and to get my wife into the Marine Corps League <laughs> so we could help out with that. And that was his goal. And he got us. But I got him too. I got him too. Jerry hadn't been going to church for five years. Jerry's a very popular name. I got a brother named Jerry. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We got him to go to church. Jerry was an amazing man, but he was a Marine. He was an enlisted Marine. And enlisted Marines do something very well. They drink beer well, they smoke well, and they curse a lot. So what happens when you bring a Jerry into a Church of the Nazarene? Jerry's are always a character. So I want you to think about Jerry. Just keep that in your head. Now I want to go back to testing. And this is where my brain is going. Hopefully you're able to catch on to my, my, my flow with this. A test in Hebrew is the word nesa. I can't even pronounce it right. Nesa. But it means something to be ventured. Something to seek after. It's supposed to be a... Tr a training event. It shows that somebody is trained. It shows that somebody is experienced. And it's also supposed to give them experience. Not just be experienced, but give them experience. And it's also to show that you can trust them. Tests have a purpose. They are beneficial, not just for the culture of academia, but in one of apprenticeship. And what God was doing right there is he was giving a test to Abraham. And this test to Abraham was to see if Abraham was, number one, he had the knowledge 
of knowing that God was God. That he had the wisdom level to trust God. And that God could trust Abraham with his greatest things. If Abraham had not done what he did, not taken his son up on the mountain and done that, God would have never had the full truth of Abraham. And Abraham wouldn't have had the full truth of Abraham himself. Because Abraham had to know that he would take it to the umpteenth degree. To the furthest way he could go. Abraham had to know that Abraham could be the father of many nations. Abraham had to know that he could trust God. And that he would trust God. When, when, when rubber meets the road, Abraham was going to do it. That's what that test was for. It wasn't a test to see... It wasn't God's cosmic joke. It wasn't God just playing like a, a, a person burning an ant pile. It was God allowing Abraham to learn from his own test. Abraham probably didn't know how far he would go. He probably didn't have a clue before this day. But he trusted. And I'm going to say it's hard to trust God sometimes. It is hard to trust God when he calls you to go someplace that doesn't seem right. It is hard to trust God when he changes your life like that. But Abraham used this test to gain knowledge of himself, to gain wisdom about his relationship with God. And it allowed him to gain trust in God. Because this God of great... Well, we'll get there in a second. Article 10. I'm going to tell you, nobody at Cathedral Heights knew what Article 10 was. I was very disappointed. But it's okay, because how many people have memorized their manual? I don't expect you to have the mem manual memorized, so don't worry about this. Does anybody know what Article 10 in the, in the manual of the Church of the Nazarene is? No, I've read it, but I don't remember it. Amy Beth? She just had it this morning, Amy. No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? I didn't go to church this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> she, she played hooky, so she's new on this one. Because uh -huh. her back was out, so she didn't go so with me. Article 10. You remember Article 10? I can't do Well, Article, yeah, one of our faith articles. Article 10. Any clue? No? No, no takers. All right. Well, how about this? What makes us peculiar and different from every other denomination? Holiness. Which would be? Sanctification. Entire sanctification. Article 10 is based about entire sanctification. Amen. Christian perfection or holiness. And I love this one because this is what we are. But the thing is, we had a litmus test. Especially, if you just go back 10 years ago, our litmus test was kind of pharisaic, wasn't it? Our idea on of the perfect Nazarene, or or a, somebody who is sanctified, or holy, or Christian perfected, was always this. Do they believe in the right idea of evolution? Do they have a good creation theory? Do they have a good, are they premillennial, or are they postmillennial? Brzee was premillennial for anybody who even has a clue what that is. What is the age of the earth? What is their worship style? Do they worship like us? Do they res what is their response to homosexuality? What are their views on drinking? You don't, you don't uh, homosexuality is a sin, and drinking is too. See, these are what we have. And these are the things that we thought were evidences of people who were entirely sanctified. But I want to show you something. What is the one thing, the one characteristic 
the one indicator, the one revealing factor, the defining thing that tells us of the presence of the Holy Spirit inside a person. Do you all know? Perfect love. You can define a holy person by the love coming out of them. And we, as Nazarenes, should have love exuding from us every moment of our life. Because the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And it may mean at this moment in time, we can be as sanctified as we can be. And I'm telling you, Brother Jerry was as sanctified as Brother Jerry was going to be before his death. But I promise you, I'm going to see him in heaven. Even though he liked beer, and he liked smoking, and he liked drinking. Actually, he quit smoking because he had COPD. He quit he, smoking. You know, but he did curse from time to time. And he was still a loving man who loved for the sake of loving others. He loved for the sake of God. He loved the sake of Jesus. Not for the sake of his lifting up. Not for the sake of his specialness. He loved because that's what he was made to do. And I'm telling you, each and every one of us is made to love people. And I don't mean self-serving love. I mean the kind of love that loving people is an action. It's something we do. It's not a feeling. It's not a happy blessing. It is what we do, and sometimes it's hard. I didn't say we have to like everybody. Because loving is caring. Loving is caring. Loving is doing caring things. Loving is beyond what everybody seems to think we do. But I promise you, when you love people, when you love the broken, the needy, the poor, the thirsty, the hungry, the widows, the orphans, when you take care of those who need it, you get to live something different. You get to have something different inside of you. Every time you are obedient to the Holy Spirit, you are obedient to the actions, the desire of God, you do feel it. Janie, when you feed people, do you feel good? Uh -huh. When you bring them food, do you feel good? Yeah. When you, when you play your guitar for the church, do you feel good? Yeah. When you pray for people like nothing else, do you feel good? When you teach coffee girls, do you feel good? Mm -hmm. When you do something with love, do you feel good? Mm -hmm. That is holiness. That is what drives us. God gives us this power. That is His Holy Spirit that shows us so much love and mercy and truth. But the thing is, it's not like the test that we see in society today. It's not a one-size-meets-all thing. Today, you can be in love with God, in, in love with humanity, the creation of God, the image of God, loving them, taking care of them, showing them great things. But unless you grow tomorrow, you're falling backwards. The thing about sanctification is it keeps going. It is the difference between being saved and being sanctified. It is a never-ending thing. To be saved, all you have to do is come to Jesus and ask Him to forgive your sins. It's really not complicated. And then come under his lordship but when you come under his lordship it's a path everybody out there preaches that but I'm going to tell you there is more because as you grow in God you grow in Christ you grow in the Holy Spirit you get to enjoy it it's not the normal prosperity gospel it's not the I don't know it's not it's not what we see is normal, but we are holy because God is holy. And that's why we strive towards holiness. It's not the same thing as the, the normal prosperity. If you're doing... You're no longer babes in Christ. Yeah, you're no longer babes in Christ. And I'm going to say it's not going to take away the horrible things that are going to happen in your life. There are going to be horrible things that happen in your life. 
Right, Janie? You understand that. There are horrible things that happen in our lives. Yeah. And it happens. But that just means that we aren't alone. Amen. And it keeps growing. And it's not an easy thing to do. And today, it's going to be different than it is tomorrow. And tomorrow, it's going to be next to the, different than the next day. And it's going to keep growing. But Abraham was an interesting fellow. He stood above his son, ready to kill his son because he trusted God. He knew that nothing bad would happen to his son. Nothing that his son couldn't handle with God. Abraham trusted in God. It was a test. And we all have those tests every day of our lives. But these tests don't say we're a failure. These tests say, next. We live in an apprenticeship with Jesus Christ. We call it discipleship. And yeah, I know those chairs are uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, I have back and hip problems. I'm sorry. It's okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I swear I'm almost done. You're fine. It's okay. I promise. I'm just getting old. <laughs> Don't even. <laughs> but the thing is, is God gave it to him. God let him have that moment of fear, but he trusted. The thing about Brother Jerry... Brother Jerry was probably one of the most Christian men I've ever met in my life. Beyond a lot of the people who don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't. I promise you, he had a heart for more people. And he touched more people spreading the good news than almost everybody I've ever known. Jerry was destitute when he died. He had no money for his funeral, and his family had no money for his funeral. The city paid for his funeral. Wow. Not just, the, I mean, like, all the people from the community came together. Different organizations, churches, people. We crowdfunded his funeral. I was, Amy and I, Amy went onto the news to, to, to crowdfund for his funeral, and I, and they put my sermon, as I was preaching his funeral, out into the city to help pay for his funeral. Yeah. Even, the, even the funeral home helped pay for his funeral wow. because they loved Jerry so much because Jerry was there for every military funeral that ever happened. It didn't, matter, it didn't matter if you were Marine, Army, Air Force, or Navy. He was there for your funeral. And we did taps for lots of them and we did... Lots of salutes. It was, a little, it was interesting doing it. But that was Jerry's passion, taking care of the families of the, the heroes that served around him. Jerry was an amazing man. But he wasn't a normal Nazarene. In fact, I couldn't... I, I couldn't even get the board to make him a member. <laughs> But G Jerry was probably the best Nazarene among all of us because his heart was there and he was constantly doing it. He wasn't just coming to church. He was living church. And that's what impressed me about this man. And Abraham probably wasn't the most pious person you ever met. But he fell to God. And that's what we're all called to do. For God is our King, our Lord and Savior. He calls us to be peculiar people in a world where we don't fit in. And it's okay. So, I'm going to continue. I know y'all have seen this a million times, but I'm going to say it a million times more because I want it to be in the front of our church. We're a two-law church. And two-law church means what? Love, love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, with all our soul, and love our neighbor as Jesus first loved us. We are a church of prayer, 
Which means... We pray. Honestly. <laughs> and fervently. We are a church of stewardship. If we have a gift, we give it. And that's the way it's got to be. We are a church, uh, we are a missional church. That means we are seeking after the mission of God, and we are growing. And I think, as my brain is moving and going, I think I'm going to lose the word church, and I'm going to put congregation from now on, if that's okay with everybody else. Because church is just one. I mean, church is not just one. Church is all. We are a missional congregation. Church, but again. I know, it's just... The theological thing, but I was just yeah. letting y'all know I'm going to do it. Because church is spoke of in the, in the scripture. It's a body. It's not a building. Yeah, yeah. We are a church who seeks after God's will with everything we do. And that is true. And this is what I tried to put on the things this week, but didn't show up on the things this week. Um, you know, we have coffee girls on, t- on Tuesday. Um, you coming to coffee girls this week? I'll zoom probably. You gonna zoom? here because the time zoom. My time it, we is zoom over it too. With, my time is oh. over with. I am so you, it it is here. You can come here in person if you want. If you're still gonna be here. Seven o'clock at night. But you. So when I it, just know that I'm lo- I'm leaving on the second. Okay. So that just zoom. You just zoom. Just, just zoom. zoom in. Well, she's leaving on the second, so she'll still be here. We can pick her up. Yeah. Um. So we're studying. Um, The lady who gave two points. Yeah. Widow the Miter? Widow, yeah. No. No? Well, she was a widow, but it's the lady who gave two points. Okay. And um, that's what we're studying. So we're going to talk a little bit about tithing and giving to the church. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's going to be exciting. That's going to be fun. Uh, connecting with Jesus. Uh, Wednesday, I am going to do it again. I'm going to try it. Randy? We'll pick you up this week for Wednesday. Wednesday, 6 p.m. here. We'll pick you up because you can't And online. Okay. Work. okay. Um, and the worship service next Sunday. And uh, we'll be here. Online and in person. Yeah. And every week. I've been missing this one. <laughs> Grace, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for letting us be here, Lord God. I ask that you bless us as we go forth. Keep our mind on you and test us every day so we can learn how to love you more and love, learn how to love your image bearers more. Be with us till we meet again. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. God is good.